All right, so now that we have gone through the first three observers, let's take a look at the final one, which is the performance observer. Now the observer part of this API is again very similar to the rest. You'll find that the overall implementation is more or less the same. So the primary focus of this video will be the performance API and all the metrics it provides us in order to improve our application's performance. It will make more sense this way and you'll have a better understanding of both the APIs. So the performance API is a set of standards used to measure the performance of web applications. Based on the data that this API provides us, we can then make better decisions on how to improve the overall performance of the application. Now there are various kinds of metrics that you can focus on to improve performance. For example, the resources that an application has to download can be a metric. We can analyze which resource is taking a long time to download and based on that make a calculated decision to make it more efficient. Another example would be the largest contentful paint of your web app. In simple terms, this is the time taken to render the largest image or text block within the viewport. So all the images, videos and text notes are taken into consideration and the most amount of time taken to render any one of these elements will be the largest contentful paint or LCP in short. Once you know which element takes the most amount of time, you can then figure out how to reduce this time by making certain adjustments. Just like these metrics, there are several others that we will take a look at throughout this video. Now for each of these metrics, there will be a performance entry. This entry is just an object that will hold information related to a particular metric. This is just like any other entry that we have seen in the previous observer videos. A mutation observer callback registers an entry anytime there is a change in the DOM tree of an element. An intersection observer callback registers an entry anytime the target element intersects a container like a viewport. A resize observer callback registers an entry anytime the target element changes its size. Similarly, for different performance events, corresponding performance entries will be registered. This entry will have a bunch of properties depending on the type of the performance metric. But each entry will have a name, a duration, a start time and a type property. These four properties will be common across all of the entries. Now for the most part, you don't really have to do anything to get these entries. Most of the performance entries are recorded in the browser. You can directly access them via the performance object that's present on the global object. Inside this object, you'll find a get entries method that will give you information related to all the performance events that have taken place inside your application. So let me show you what I mean by this. Inside this body tag, I'll just create one h1 element and I'll run this in the browser. Now inside the browser console, let me just clear this and I can access the performance object that's present on the window object, the global object. And inside this performance object, I get the get entries method. If I run this method, you'll see that we have these performance entries here. We have six performance entries and these entries are basically performance events that have already taken place since the beginning of this application. So there are different kinds of events. There's a performance navigation event. There are performance mark events that come from this Grammarly extension that I have in my browser. There are paint entries. There are event timing entries. All these entries give us information related to the corresponding events that have taken place. Now the problem is this get entries method on the performance object is not responsible for notifying you about any new events. Also, anytime you call this method, it's going to give you all the events from the very beginning. So you'll have to manually filter out the duplicate events as each get entries call will return all the entries as soon as the page gets loaded in the browser. To receive notifications about the entries as they become available and to avoid the duplicate events problem, we'll use the performance observer. Now the performance observer will look for any specific performance event and whenever that event gets triggered, you can access that information related to the event inside a callback function. So let's create a simple implementation. We use the same performance observer class to instantiate an observer and inside it, we pass in a callback function. The callback function has access to a list object which has three methods, get entries method, get entries by name and get entries by type. 
you can get all the entries or you can filter the entries based on their name or the type. Speaking of entries, when listening for events in the application, you have to explicitly mention the event or the entry type that we want to observe. So inside the observe method, we get to pass in an options object which has an entry types property. This is going to be an array with whatever entry types you would want to observe. You can actually check what all events are present in your browser that we can then observe using the observer. So inside the browser console, I'll type in performance observer and supported entry types. So this gives us a list of entries supported by the browser, which can be observed by the observer. I'll just copy the whole list and paste it inside the observe method. You can also pass in a single entry using the type option. So instead of the entry types that will take in a bunch of values, if I only want to track a single event, I'll use the type option instead. There's another Boolean option that's available, which is called the buffered option. So this option enables the observer to access entries from before the observer's creation. This way, we do not miss any information on the performance events between the start of the page load and the observer creation. Now, since this buffer is just like any other storage, there's also going to be a limit. So there might be a chance wherein the buffer is full and there are some additional events yet to be added to it. Now, there's not much that you can do about this, but the API at least provides us with a way to get the number of dropped entries due to the buffer being full. You can achieve this by passing in a parameter inside the callback function. The first parameter was the list of entries. The second one for all the observers, not just this one, is the observer itself. So I can pass in the observer as the second parameter. And the third parameter will give you the count of dropped entries, which you can track for any particular use case. So I can simply access the count of the drop entries using this third parameter. There are ways using which you can increase the size of this buffer as well, but we won't go into that in this video. You can look it up in your own free time. Now I'll just get rid of these two parameters because we won't be needing them in our example. So now that we have this basic implementation ready, let's go inside the browser. Right from the get go, you can see that numerous performance events get fired, providing us with important information. Now these won't make sense to you as it is. So instead, let's look at these events one by one. Now each performance event will have a corresponding performance entry object, which we get inside the callback function. There's a main interface called performance entry, which acts as a parent for all the types of entries. That's again the reason why you'll find the common properties across the entries that I had previously mentioned in this video. The rest of the properties will be specific to that entry type. So yeah, let's get started. So the first one is the element entry type. This type will contain information related to the render timing for image and text nodes. These nodes will have to be marked by us if we want to track their render information. So we use the element timing attribute on these elements. I'll also add an image tag and attach the same attribute to it. I already have an image present inside the project directly. So I'm going to use this image inside my image tag. Now inside the H1 tag, I'll use the element timing attribute and I'll set the value to dummy text. Similarly, now that we are focusing on each event individually, let me just comment out the rest of these events. Now inside the browser, you'll find these two events. Now since the API is still in its early stages, the properties here might change based on when you're watching this video. We have the common properties from the main performance entry, the start time, the type, the duration, and the name. Now in some cases, these common properties might not be useful for that event. So what the API does is, it sets a default value for that property. For instance, the duration property that we have here is always going to be zero. You'll see a similar pattern for other entries as well. The element in this case is either an image or an H1 tag. Entry type as we have set inside our observe method is going to be element. We don't have IDs for both of our elements, so it's going to be an empty string. 
The identifier is the value that we have provided to the element timing attribute inside both of our elements. Intersection rect will give you the size and position information for that DOM element. It's of the type DOM rect and I've covered this in detail in the last three videos of this series. So yeah, you can go check them out. The load time is going to give you the time that it took to load this element. The name property for image nodes is going to be image paint and for text nodes it's going to be text paint. The natural height and width will give you the height and width of that DOM element. For text nodes it's going to be zero. The start time and the render time is essentially the same. The only time it will differ is if the render time is zero. If that's the case then the start time will be equal to the load time. And finally there's this URL which is basically the location pointing to the resource. In the case of text nodes it's going to be an empty string. You also get a two JSON method on this entry. Well actually for all entries because it's part of the performance entry interface. So you can use it to convert the entry into a JSON object and maybe then pass it into certain analytics endpoints to generate reports.